Ben Goldfarb and Derek Gao, the former from the United States, the latter from the United Kingdom, both authors of engaging, entertaining, informative books about the importance of beavers and their reintroduction to their respective landscapes. This is Michael Mativier. As Ben and Derek's editor at Chelsea Green Publishing, I had the honor of working with them on their highly different yet complementary books about North American and Eurasian beavers, their advocates and their obstacles. Here they are in recent conversation about one of nature's most extraordinary engineers. So, you know, it's, it's interesting we're, we're, we're speaking at, um, you know, kind of this, this curious time in, in, uh, in the wider world, of course, the, you know, the news is relentlessly negative, but uh, in, in the very niche world of beaver advocacy, uh, it, you know, it's kind of a, a landmark week, obviously, the government officially permitted beavers to remain in the, in the River Otter, um, where they've been uh, living for, for many years, but their status was in doubt. Uh, I mean, how did, how did, Britain get to this moment that uh, that the, the the great beaver question was resolved in your favor. Well, you know, I think what <laughs> I can't remember who it was that said to me the other day. You know, the problem with being in a conflict of any sort, even if it's a, a relatively benign conflict, like you know the reintroduction of beavers to Britain, is that you never know you're winning when the thing's actually going on. <laughs> and I think, I think, how did we get to this? We have failed so many times on, on this as an issue. We, you know, it's been considered in the 30s, fell away, failed then. Considered in the 60s, fell away, failed then. Early 70s, early 80s, the same. And I think what happened this time is possibly it came off time because the thinking was different. Just the thinking about, you know, what, what the countryside was about, about the fact that, you know, it didn't always have to be intensive agriculture in whatever form it takes. Or, or was there not another way of viewing it? Was beginning to grow tiny green tendrils of hope. And really, it, it, it's just grown and grown with every small project, large project, escape, um, you know, the government try. I mean, there's some of the best things that have happened to the government basically saying, right, okay, they're not going to be there, we're going to kill them. And for the first time ever, skip the beaver stuff in land use politics, when the people who surround an animal like this are given a chance to actually assume their own voice, they say, no, that's not the way it's going to be. What does rewilding mean to you, Derek, and, and where do beavers fit into that framework? For me, I don't think beavers are anything about rewilding. I think beavers are about restoring a lost natural process in a cultural landscape, acceptably, that, 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 can, that can bear the return within reality. Very little pain if you're looking at the kind of landscapes we're looking at here in the southwest with river corridors full of trees, a few cows, a few sheep. The fact that there are beavers in the bottom there, for most people, is nothing. Um, so I, I think they're an animal that we can, we, can, we can accept back into the landscapes that we have with a degree of intellectual readjustment. And it's this intellectual readjustment that really is so critically important. Understanding that you know there might be a higher purpose for the landscape than just intensive industrialized agriculture. I guess why, how have how and why have cultural mores shifted the way they 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 have around what the landscape is for? Mm. Well, I'll tell you one of the really interesting aspects of that. I don't know if this, is, this is answering your question directly or not. Is that we're living through we're living through COVID now. Um, mm. There is no clear end. 
to this situation. In the end, I think the only end there will be if vaccination is not valid is that we just have to accept it's going to be another cause of, of human mortality. At the end of the day, we're looking forward to to to, lands, you know, to a cultural landscape where we can't shake each other's hands and hug each other anymore. I mean, how how does that work yeah. for for us as a primate, which is, is you know a very touchy feely um, you know sort of creature? I, I just don't see. You know, for me, it's, it really has to be about corridors and landscape that carry nature through it, where, you know, I, where we, you know, where, where there's space for things to coexist. And then once we get that physical part right, it's down to how we adjust what's in our hearts um, to coexist as well. Because you in North America will know full well that when it comes to very many species, there are depths of darkness that surround them that are barely human in, in, in any form. And the rationale that governs our response to things like, you know, wolves with you or badgers here mm. comes from something that's, that's, that's maybe in us all, but, but some of us are better able to, able to temper and govern the response that we have to things that take something from us than others are. And, and, and yet if we can't address these two things, the... The idea that we're going to give other creatures space to live on this planet alongside and amongst us and that we're going to, to make some serious effort to tolerate their their behaviours, their whims, their, their needs and requirements and their predation too at times, then you know, there's going to be no future for anything on this, on, on this planet at all other than us. And, that, and we will not last long. Right. That touchy bottom of this truck. It's being. Now with its teeth, I'm going to run over its head, all right? <laughs> Changing tax a little bit, Derek, you know, one of the things that really uh, delighted me about your book, um, and when I said earlier that it uh, it sounded like you, uh, this is really what I was referring to, is that, it, you know, it has this very obvious uh, disdain and contempt for bureaucracy. Uh, you know, you've obviously waged this, this uh, you know, multi-decade war uh, against cautious bureaucrats and, you know, the ignorant landed gentry and close-minded farmers uh, and, uh, you know, and, and you have no, no, no love lost for that, uh, th those, those people. Um, you know, and, and beavers in your book are, are sort of this form of resistance. You know, you describe them as, as uh, totems of change and uh, a, a, challenge, a challenge to the hegemony, I think was a, a, great, a great term. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what's, what's interesting is, is, you know, here in, in the U.S., as you, you know, you, of course, you alluded to the, the Trump administration, uh, you know, and this is, you know, per, this is true in, in other ways in Britain, too, I think, you know, we're, we're the captives of this inept, willfully stupid government uh, with no interest in, in science-based policymaking. Uh, so I, I wonder, you know, what has your time in kind of the trenches of the beaver wars taught you about navigating and resisting hostile bureaucracy? Wow. Okay. Well, it's taught you to make your own mind up. I mean, like all, I mean, when I started in like any kind of career, or, and I certainly started to work in nature conservation, I sure, I believed fundamentally in the IUCN guidelines and, and all the other things that the, the, the young people of a certain age believe in. And they believe that other people are going to act well in good faith and that you can sit down and have your stakeholder meetings and, and that you'll make progress based on um, on fact, on science, on right, on on sentient thought, on on, on, on a collaborative willingness to, to you know to get it right and to do good. And as you get older you realise that you know that's just not the way of it. And, and what you find is that, I don't know, uh, if, I want to, if I want to be nobody's Christmas card list forever, well, what, what, what I guess I'd say is that, you know, you've got to be, 
You've got to be prepared to stand, one, to stand up for what you think is right and understand it very well. And then two, you've got to look at so much of the shit that surrounds it, understand that well too. And then you've got to, the next stage is, you've got to be prepared to say no. And you've got to be prepared to say no quite clearly, quite unequivocally um, to people when it's wrong. And then you've also got to get to, to I mean, I've been lucky from, from a practical point of view. I've been able to do things because I, there came a time in life where I had the resource to do that. And I am not living out my life on this planet without actually, um, you know, achieving at least some of the things I want to achieve. You know, too many people put off in life things that they consider to be important. And there are so many distractions in life. You know, the, the people you have relationships with, which, you know, that's actually quite important and fair. It's probably not a good comparison. <laughs> but, you know, things like football or baseball or whatever other bollocks we get um, abs absorbed with, they, you know, just distract you from what purpose and, and, and from things that are real. And mm. for me, the beaver thing was really always very clear. You know, you'd listen to the old guys that had failed and they and, and, and they failed with great regret and we'd talk in later life about how nearly they'd come to doing something. And then this wee wanker of a civil servant, you know, had had had, had just because these people are all employed not to rock the boat, not take the the seller tape off at Christmas. It's it's had just just said no. And you look at it and think, well, why? I mean, it's not a job to, there's no mandate from given to them by God that says they should do this. It's not mm. their job to do it. It's the job to actually produce a result. But what you end up with when it comes to any kind of bureaucracy is something that becomes slow and careful. It's there to maintain a status quo. It att attracts people who, who operate like mole rats because what they don't <laughs> want to do is have any other mole rat in that colony dig in a tunnel in the, a direction that's opposite to the ones that the mole rats have all agreed is right, even if that means digging no tunnels. And it's just, you know, in the end, you just get to the stage where you just think, well, you know, it's enough. It's just enough. If you do it in a different way and people have the ability in wider society to say what they want to say, they say, yes, do it. We want this animal back. This is important. It's moving. So for me, I never meant to ever get to the point where I became <laughs> some sort of rallying figure of opposition. Right. But it's, it's just not good enough. And we can't live life out. You know, we shouldn't live life out and, and, and achieve so little. It's the wrong thing to do, lying in a bed at the end and regretting um, um, the things you didn't do. Quite the wrong thing to do. But also from a, a planetary point of view, we all know how sick this earth is. We all know how we strip it from life. Every indice, indice certainly, in, in Britain and the developed Western European countries tells us that, that nature is hemorrhaging in a way we never believe possible. Rachel Carson's silent spring, believe you me, is here now. So when we go back mm. to what your original question was and rewilding, it's not about rewilding. It's about how we remake nature. And that may, that it's going to mean for sure giving it space, giving it corridors, taking land back from farming. Derek, I don't think anybody would ever accuse you of, of paying them reverential respect, so don't don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> To close, Derek, I, I, I wanted to ask you. You know, we talk. I mean, we talk. We talk so much in the beaver world about about what the 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 species is like and what the species does. It's the you know this amazing kind of creator of habitat and 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 water uh, and uh, and you know and ecological benefits. But we don't talk much about beavers as individuals, maybe. So as somebody who's been around more beavers than you can count probably i mean what are what are beavers like as as individuals what are what are these how would you describe the these animals well, you get some that are real shits, okay? So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not quite sure if I've, I've ever had met the Donald Trump of the beaver world yet, but, but there were some that were really horrible. I mean, there have been some that were really horrible. There was one particular family that came from Bavaria, and, you know, they were just, they were all bloody aggressive. They were, we could never pair them with anything because they always tried to kill whatever you, you, you gave them in response. And, and in the end, the best thing to do with them was just, just give up trying. 
but but in the main, you're looking at animals that are just delightful. I mean, I think I talk in a book about one tame one, and I, I can never figure out. I mean, the only thing that was very clear was that animal wanted to spend time with you. Now, it was a wild beaver. It was not a hand-reared one. Um, you know, if you went past pretty much at any time of the day and made any kind of noise that was discernible, you know, you had to make a bit of noise because otherwise you'd be sleeping. It would come out, see what you were doing. You could sit in there. You could pat the ground with your palm of your hand hard like you played with a puppy. It would bounce away gurgling. And, hmm. and that one was, there was just something about that individual that, 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 was, that was quite clearly different. The bulk of them are benign, they're slow, they're calm, they're careful. The description of the, 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 the female in Poland, you know, d talking to its babies and, and the ones waking up, that's what they're like. I mean, they uncurl slowly. They, they start murmuring. I mean, you know this, Ben, mm. murmuring, and, murmuring and mewing to each other. They'll, they'll have a little whine, a baby will cry. They'll want milk. Mummy will push it away. That's what they're like. And then, and, and that's why, again, a part, I mean, I detest the barbarity, the killing in Scotland and, and the people doing wicked things. But I, I, I realise also as, as well that this battle between people who think and people who don't, or who think in a way that's not the same as you, will be eternal. That It's never going to go away. Education will make a difference, but it's always going to be there. But then equally... And, and, and the idea that you know, you're always going to view them as cartoon things that sell something and that's the way they live, li live lives is utterly unrealistic. But in between the two, in between the two, these animals are deeply sentient, deeply caring. You know, they, they, you know there's, that, there's again the story about the, the beaver filmed by Crystal burying its babies. Mm. And Rasheen said he'd found one in Scotland you know, that, that was buried in the sediment of a dam. And what's making an animal like that do that? I mean, is it mm. doing it to, to 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 remove a smell of corruption near its abode? Is it is it a bit? I mean, that's a possibility. But but when you see how much they care for each other, it's also perfectly possible that it's doing it with a degree of re regret and forethought. And and therefore, you know, I really do think. I mean, and the, the, the fourth category of people increasingly that work with animals are people who are nervous of doing so they get very scared of making any mistakes and 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 they're just the wrong kind of class of person to be having anything to do with other living creatures at all because if you have no empathy and no care and no understanding for them then you are not the kind of person that that, that that's, that's that's going to deliver a good future fate for individuals you have mm. to care otherwise you really shouldn't be doing this Mm. And for beavers, I think as time goes on, you begin to realise that you care very deeply. You've just been hearing a conversation between Ben Goldfarb, author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter, and Derek Gao, author of the new book, Bringing Back the Beaver, the story of one man's quest to rewild Britain's waterways, both published by Chelsea Green and available from chelseagreen.com, or your favorite local bookseller. Thank you for listening.